poor people in poor countries face a whole bunch of economic constraints. And so one of the reasons you would think UBI would work is you say, all right, I'm not going to try and solve all those constraints. Instead, I'm just going to hand you some money and let you choose what and how you do to figure out solving those constraints. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. A decade ago, Universal Basic Income, UBI, is more of an economic thought experiment than a serious policy idea. But a slow accumulation of evidence, and combined with some pretty rapid changes in the way that we live and work, have converted some of the sceptics. It's opened the ideas of policymakers as well. But UBI remains a big-ticket idea, so any large-scale rollout's going to need a lot of empirical evidence to back it up. Tavneet Suri of MIT is one of the researchers involved in a test of UBI that might be accumulating that evidence. It's certainly one of the longest and largest scale experiments we've ever covered. And she joins me now. Tavneet, welcome back to Vox Dev Talks. Thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Tavneet, I haven't really explained what universal basic income UBI is. Can you do that for me? The name kind of gives it away, Tim. <laughs> it's basically an income that's provided by someone else, usually the state, that is universal. It goes to everybody. So there's no targeting. I don't try to figure out who's poor and only give it to poor people. Mm -hmm. It's basic, meaning it just covers very basic needs, right? So I'm going to buy you your flat screen TV or whatever. And it's an income. It comes regularly like an income would. It's not a one-off. For economists, what are the arguments in favor of it? Since this is Vox Dev, let me talk about developing countries sure. rather than everybody in the world, because I think this varies by whether you're thinking of developing countries or whether you're thinking of the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. And so given the experiment is also in a developing country, it makes sense to use that as context here. Poor people in poor countries face a whole bunch of economic constraints credit constraints, they can't get insurance, they have psychological constraints. You've done many of these talks for Vox Dev. Yeah. We also know that often people might face many of those, not just one, and not everybody faces all. And we also know how to alleviate some of these, but we don't always know what's the most effective way to alleviate each one. And so when you think about the world that way, and you say, oh, everybody has different constraints and different sets of constraints. And for every set of constraints or every different set of constraints, we still don't know exactly what works most cost effectively or best. Mm -hmm. This becomes a hard problem to solve with policy. And so one of the reasons you would think UBI would work is you say, all right, I'm not going to try and solve all those constraints. I'm not going to try and figure out what is Tim's specific constraints and how do I solve those for Tim and what are Tim needs specific constraints and how do I solve those for her? Mm -hmm. Instead, I'm just going to hand you some money and let you choose what and how you do to figure out solving those constraints. You might be best equipped to figure out which is the most binding constraint for you, the most important for you to alleviate. And so we give you the cash to figure that out. So in this world with multiple economic constraints, you might believe that a UBI lets people figure that out themselves and solve it. So that's one of the arguments that we make for a UBI. The other is this might be a way to kick people out of a poverty trap. And so if you feel like there's poverty traps, but there's opportunities out there that could have increasing returns for people, but they just can't make them because they're in this poverty trap, then a UBI might get you out. And then there's a bunch of other common arguments that also apply actually to the developed world. This idea of UBI is it creates a bit more freedom. It lets you do what you always wanted to do. If you always wanted to do podcast Tim and you couldn't create a market for them and get paid for them, mm -hmm. this would let you do that. And you would be very, very happy for it. People can go do what they've always wanted to do. In the developed world, you could also think that welfare comes with stigma and it's going to absolve all of those kind of notions of stigma around welfare or stigma around being identified as the poor person in a community. And that might be true also in the developing world. So there's other arguments around changing our view of what a good life is. Is it really about income earning or is it really about people being happy doing what they want to do in life? And then finally, I just want to say the universality piece is kind of interesting. Mm. It's about everybody getting it. And so when you think about that, it could have benefits. We could all get together and there's no road in our village and we put a bit of our money together from the UBI and we get a ah, road. Yeah. So you could imagine that there's coordination that we could do if everybody got it. 
targeting tends to be very inefficient in some sense. So when I try to figure out who's poor and not poor, this costs time, money, energy, data collection in poor countries, and it's never perfect. There's a lot of work now showing that not all poor people live in poor households, but yet we measure poverty at the household level. And so we're missing poor people. There's in fact poor women in pretty rich households in some poor countries. If that's true, then universality actually does better at reaching poor people, even if they're living in non-poor households. So that's another argument on the universality side. So there might be other benefits that are not just about a transfer, but around the universality itself that could create extra benefits in communities and then create larger impacts potentially of any cash transfers. That's a lot of powerful arguments, Daphne. Actually, it was more than I was expecting. But it is fair to say that in everywhere in the world, the sceptics outnumber the people who are in favour. What is their objection? So the first is it's really costly. Mm -hmm. It it is expensive. If I measure out for sub-Saharan Africa and I took a basic level, like close to what we're doing in Kenya, and said, if I gave this to everybody, it would be something like 17% of GDP. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Yeah. It's a lot. Just very simply, can we afford it? Mm -hmm. To me, the answer to that depends on what does it do to people? It depends on what the benefits are. Can we afford it? What's it? I need to understand what it is before I decide whether we can afford it. The second is one that's a worry across the board, labor supply. Will people just stop working because they have a basic income? The third is inflation. You're handing out a lot of income. Will this show up in higher prices? And I guess another that we really worried about was changing social structures in a negative way. So there's a few examples of this. Crime. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more money. Does this create more crime? Does it create more elite capture? So imagine we do this in a village and the village elder comes around and says, guess who brought this program to you? I was the one. You need to give me some informal taxation. So we're worried that that might happen. You could see a restructuring of these payments around hierarchies and elite systems. And then in developing countries, there's a lot of social structure around economics. Social networks matter for all sorts of stuff, for risk sharing, for all sorts of economic outcomes. You know, if everybody gets a UBI, does it start to break down some of these social structures because you need them less? Mm -hmm. And could that have consequences? So I think those are the downsides that people often talk about and that we thought about too. How much do we actually know about this then, Tavni? Because I talk about these issues every week to your colleagues, but those interventions are on a much smaller scale and for a much shorter time than a UBI would be for. We know very little truly on a UBI. There's some experiments running in the developed world. They're not you at all. Mm -hmm. They're basic income ones. They're heavily, heavily, heavily targeted to the poor. So these are just cash transfers to the poor. It's a basic income experiment. They're often quite small in size because, you know, the basic income that you have to give in the U.S. is slightly larger than in a developing country. So there's a few of those around. Universal, we think of as both across people. Everybody gets it. But I also think of universality as about time. People get it for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Maybe not forever because we can't do forever. But It needs to be pretty long and systematic for it to mimic what we would want in UBI. So I think there's very few that have done that. I would say the only places that have done that and that are universal and very long term would be Iran and Alaska Mm -hmm. in a particular way. They give back some of their oil revenues to their citizens directly. Ah, right. And so Alaska does that. And so does Iran. There's been a couple of studies on this showing no decreases in labor force participation, if anything, in Iran increases amongst women. But because it's such a big program and it's truly universal, it goes to every citizen, there's limited data that they have on being able to look at this, right? They're using census data or something, which is just doesn't have a ton of outcomes. The Alaska one, it's very small in amount because it's just oil revenues. In Iran, it started out large, but they've had a lot of inflation and they didn't index it. So it ended up being quite small after 20 years of inflation, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we really know all that much about the plus side and the downside that I was mentioning to you. We know maybe snippets of bits and pieces from those two, but certainly not a full picture. I think there's still a lot of work to do to understand whether UBI is actually worth the cost. Could we end up, therefore, just never implementing UBI, because if you're a policymaker, there's always a cheaper policy that you know more about. 
Potentially. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping we'll fill that gap so then people will know what this does and then you don't have an excuse if it is indeed beneficial. (laughs) I mean, Mm. caveat that. As we talk about the results from our experiment, I think there's some effects that kind of start changing how you think about cost as well. And so we'll talk about that, I'm sure. So Tavneet, tell me about your experiment. What are you doing? Where is it? Who does it apply to? How ambitious is it? How long term is it? All right, let's launch into that. Let's too. launch it. That, I think there's a lot to tell on this, isn't there? Yes. So when we talk about our UBI experiment, we've been running a large field experiment or randomized control trial on universal basic income in Kenya. Mm-hmm. And it's in two counties in Kenya. It's about 295 villages. And we split those villages into three treatment groups. One we call a true UBI. It's a monthly income that every adult gets. So I'll come back to that in a second. And they get it for 12 years. We committed to 12 years. Mm-hmm. It's not forever, but it's about basically what we could afford out of yeah, what we raised. 12 years is a long time. For people who are not used to getting anything like this, 12 years must seem like a very long time. Yeah. And if you think of most developing countries, they don't do 12 years, no. even in their cash transfer programs, right? So a lot of developing countries have cash transfer programs. They tend to be monthly incomes, but they're mostly two years. Mm-hmm. So We have a treatment group that's the UBI. It's a 12-year UBI for every adult. And then we decided we wanted to compare this to some alternatives that are cheaper. Because like I said, the one big issue with the UBI is it's extremely costly. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to compare it to a two-year UBI, which is like what a lot of cash transfers look like, except ours is universal, not targeted to just the poor. It's a two-year version, but universal. And then we're also going to compare it to a group where we give the two-year sum as a lump sum Mm -hmm. up front at the beginning of two years. So we take the two-year total value and we basically give it to you all up front. And so those are the three treatment groups. It covers about 295 villages. I'm not sure how much detail you want. I would like to know how much they're getting. Let me tell you how many people, because it's kind of large, and then we Mm. can do amounts. There's about 5,000 adults in the long-term arm. Mm. There's about close to 9,000 adults in the lump sum and short-term arms. So it's quite large. And they're getting the equivalent of, in PPP terms, $1.88 $1.88 a day. Mm-hmm. And like I said, this is per adult. Most cash transfers are household, not adult. They're at the household level. Mm-hmm. And this is all delivered over mobile money, which I think now everybody knows lots about. So I don't have to talk about that. Yeah. And so every adult has their own phone with their own mobile money account and they get it delivered directly to their account. Adult women have their own phone, their own account and their own UBI as well. Wow. Yeah. And that's also quite different from the existing studies around. Tavni, whose idea was this? Who put up the money for it? That's a great question. I think Give Directly wanted to try a UBI. The money comes from a long list of donors that took a few years to fundraise for. I'm not surprised. I think the payments are approximately on the order of about $25 million worth if we mm-hmm. add up all of the 12 years plus all the other arms. And then, of course, the study costs separately because we got to collect data. We'll be collecting data for a very long time, Tim, because we'll definitely Mm. collect data until year 12. And then people will want to know when you stop at 12, does anything fade out? Do effects disappear? So I think we'll be collecting data for a very long time to come. You'll be collecting data for the rest of your career to have needs. It's worse than that, Tim. I joke that most people want to figure out who they leave their wealth to in a will. I'm like, who do I leave the UBI project to? I don't have any wealth to speak of, but the UBI project at that point will be a lot of my life's work, my guess is it will get handed off to someone else as well. I'm sure there's plenty of people listening to this now who are thinking, I'd love to get involved with that. So I don't think you'll have a problem (laughs) with that. However, we've got to do the work first of all in the short term. What outcomes are you looking for? What are you measuring here? So we measured a lot of stuff. Let me tell you where we're at. The results I'm going to tell you about are at the two-year mark. Okay. And what's nice about the two-year mark is all of the arms have gotten the same amount of money, just in different structures with different expectations of the future. Mm -hmm. The short term is coming to the end of their payments. They got two years. Every month they're done. The lump sum had the same amount of money, but up front, and they've been done for two years. Mm -hmm. And the long term, their true UBI has gotten two years of money 
but they know that they have 10 more years coming. So even though they just have two years worth, they all know that there's still quite a long ways to go on the UBI. So the two-year mark is kind of interesting to study because of this particular design of the experiment, right? Everybody has the same money. It's just different structures and different expectations. Mm -hmm. And then we ran household surveys, as you can imagine, to measure every household outcome that we could think of. We also collected a census on all the enterprises. So think of non-agricultural enterprises, mm -hmm. small firms, close to 10,000 of those in these communities. And then we collected data from village elders on the public good side, you know, that story I gave you, we could build a road or maybe hire a teacher or something. We wanted to know mm -hmm. if that happened. And then we did price surveys, worrying about inflation, remember? So we're going to measure prices in the markets. So we mapped out all the markets in these areas and then collected prices on a couple hundred different goods in those markets. So quite extensive data collection to try and hit all of those possible pluses and possible minuses of the UBI. So much to talk about for this, but I know that I'm going to be interviewing you about this for the rest of my career as well. So. <laughs> well, it might not be me too. Uh, yeah. We don't have to do it all now, but let's have a look at some of what you found out so far. And clearly what most people talk about is that incentive to work. Do people carry on working? That's used as an objection against all sorts of poverty relief interventions. What has happened about people's work? We don't find any reductions in work. If anything, we find slight increases. They're not different from zero statistically, but we can rule out reductions pretty clearly or any reduction. Right. What you do changes. Mm -hmm. We don't see work hours go down, but we do see people leave wage jobs and start their own businesses. Interesting. So you see a switch away from wage work, but more than compensated by the increases in working in your own firm or in someone's firm. That sort of plays into what you were talking about, about the chance to be able to make your own decisions and to have some choices in your life. What about any other arms of people working the same amount, more or less? I'm going to reorient your question a bit because it allows me to talk about the piece that actually I found the most surprising result of all. Mm -hmm. There's a big increase in the number of enterprises in the UBI arm. So the number of enterprises goes up between 20 to 40 percent. And then we look at their revenues and we see almost a doubling of revenues in the village as a whole. So imagine I took all the enterprises in the village and aggregate up to the village to get a sense of what's the enterprise revenue in the whole community and those close to double. And those are largely in the lump sum and the UBI arms, the long-term UBI arm. We see much smaller effects in the short-term arm. And so there is a difference by arms here in the enterprise side. And, you know, the work hours are going to match that difference. And so we see this enterprise growth in the lump sum in the long term. We see a small enterprise growth in the short term, but much smaller and not as big a revenue increase and big revenue increases in those two arms. Like I said, the work hours that we're seeing switching also are more focused on the arms that have more enterprises, of course. Now, tell me about consumption as well. Uh, are people consuming more and does that change according to which arm of the program you're on? We do see increases in consumption, 10 to 20 percent increases. They're not dramatically different by arm, actually. They're about the same. We're not seeing revolutionary changes in consumption. We're seeing measured changes in consumption. Large chunks of that is food consumption. There's a bit mm -hmm. more education expenditures and stuff. On the food side, we also see not just food per se, but like also protein goes up, right? So we're seeing perhaps more protein, which is good. And that's not different by arms. So everybody's just eating a little more. The big difference in arms is coming out of the structure of what you're doing with your life, what your work is and where you're working and where you're earning revenues. And then this, of course, comes back into incomes because some of those revenues are incomes for the household. And so there are increases in incomes. We also see wages change because imagine wage work goes down, mm -hmm. wages actually go up uh -huh. because there's less people in wage work. And so you're going to see this increase in wages that comes with it. Are people happier, more satisfied with their lives when they have a UBI? We do see that. We actually see reductions in depression in all three arms Great. on the order of 10 to 20 percent reductions in whether people say they're depressed or not. The largest reductions are, of course, in the long-term arm because it's providing you security and you know that security is guaranteed for another 10 years. Of course. The smallest effects are actually in the lump sum arm. 
where we gave the lump sum. And that might be because you got the money two years ago. The effects on mental health didn't last. Or it could be you started a business and this creates stress and you don't have the compensating small bits of money like the long-term guys coming in the future to offset that. So we don't actually know what's driving that difference, but there we do see a difference. But all three arms do see improvements in mental health for sure, just largest in the long-term UBI arm. Have you seen any general equilibrium effects? Because, of course, if prices just go up, then it swallows up the basic income and we're back where we started. Prices are weird things in economics, as you can imagine. Let me do prices of Mm. consumer goods that you're buying in the markets. There we don't see much inflation. We do see new products come into the market because people are getting a UBI and spending it. And so you actually see the range of availability of products goes up. There's new stuff in these villages for the first time, but we don't see inflation much. We do see some prices go up. We think of a wage rate as a price that does go up. The other one that goes up is land prices. And that's because of many reasons. One could be these are just better places to live in. And that shows up in prices because these are better communities. There's more going on. There's more businesses. There's more restaurants. There's more all sorts of stuff, right? It could also be you're investing more and therefore land is worth more. Land prices and wages go up. And we think of those as things that don't move and trade very well. And that's why Mm -hmm. the prices go up. But things that we trade pretty regularly, consumer goods, we don't see much price effects. We're only two years, only two years (laughs) into this. How much do we know from what you've been able to understand so far about UBI as policy? Yeah, I think we still have a long way to go, Tim. I have to be honest. I know UBI was always going to take time to research, right? Because of this universal nature. I will say one thing. The short term does not do as well as the lump sum and costs the same. Mm -hmm. And so given a lot of cash transfers right now are short term arm-esque, it seems like there's a more efficient way to do that potentially. So thinking through that, I think is important policy-wise. The question for us is right now, the lump sum and the long-term UBI look quite similar at two years. It's quite amazing that the lump sum gets you the long-term UBI. One thing you didn't ask is why and why not the short term. And so let me add a bit of that flavor because I think it's important. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the long term are getting exactly what the short term are getting, yet they're somehow managing to make investments in enterprises that the short term are not. And so we try to figure out why this was. And basically what we saw is the long term arm uses something called a ROSCA, a rotating savings and credit association. What is this? I get together with some people every week we meet. See, there's five of us. We each put in a dollar every week. And one week we draw straws. If I win the straw, I take home the pot. Ah, right. Yes. And so it's a way to actually change your monthly income into a lump sum. Mm -hmm. So we see the long-term UBI arm use Roscas to convert their UBI into lump sums. And that's why they look like the lump sum arm. They're trying to convert their incomes into lump sums to make investments. I think the short-term arm doesn't do that, and it could be for a couple of different reasons. One, they know it's only two years. Mm -hmm. The long-term know it's 10 years, and they go, I can do this for a couple of years, make an investment, and then I still have this there. The short-term might think, oh, I need to buy some food for my kids. I need to do all these other things. It's only here for two years, and I have to do all these other things first, right? Think of the poverty trap story I told you. Maybe the lump sum is enough and then you grow and you thrive and everything goes fine. And there's not a huge difference between the long term and the lump sum. That's an open question for us. We see them pretty similar right now. Do they diverge or do they just stay the same? Is it worth the extra 10 years of money? And I think that we'll just have to wait for the next round of results to know. I'm looking forward to it, Tavneet. Thank you very much for talking about it today. Anytime, Tim. Happy to be here. The paper is called Universal Basic Income Short-Term Results from a Long-Term Experiment in Kenya. And the authors are Abhijit Banerjee, Michael Fay, Alan Kruger, Paul Niehaus and Tavni Suri. 
This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find us there. Our past episodes, as always, are at voxdev.org, where you'll find articles about the papers and the subjects we feature.